Not long ago, the law school held a panel discussion on our state's boom or bust economy. A fresh voice was that of UW law professor Tar Rigetti. Rigetti is a former CEO of Berkeley Geoimaging, a limited liability corporation that develops and manages gas and oil assets in the mid-continent, Rockies, and Gulf of Mexico. She shared her thoughts with our Leslie Wagoner on how the public sector might better handle the ups and downs of our energy-based economy. So Tara, what is it that you do here at UW? So I'm new to the university. I joined uh, here in July. Uh, I teach oil and gas law, uh, one and two, so an introductory class and a more advanced class at the College of Law. Um, I teach energy resource management at the School of Energy Resources, which is the capstone class for students uh, in that degree program. And then uh, in next year, I'll be teaching uh, energy law and policy class in the Energy MBA program. During a, a presentation that you gave to a set of law students here at UW, you were talking about um, their careers in relation to a volatile energy industry, an inter energy market. And um, something you said was about bust, I guess you say bust proofing their careers. Right. What would you advise for, say, a, on a state level, Wyoming? Right, so it's not a perfect analog, but I do think there's some carryover. Um, my advice to students was to sort of diversify themselves in terms of what they could provide to their clients. And I think uh, diversification is a great model in terms of being able to weather the volatility uh, that we see in the commodity price market. Uh, so how the state you know, could do this, uh, one great example of how Wyoming has done this in the past was with the generation tax on wind power, okay. um, which provided a number of, of different options. It encouraged innovation uh, by allowing companies to recoup their investment in the early years. Uh, it provided revenue to counties to take into account the externalities produced by some of that development, uh, and it provided revenue to the state. Uh, and so that was one way that we took something that uh, is very uh, resistant to these types of price swings because, as we all know, the wind kind of blows relentlessly, mm -hmm. um, and turned it into a revenue source and a source of innovation and investment in the state. Um, so in general, I think that's kind of the model, is to invest in new technologies okay. and infrastructure, uh, bring in partners, uh, see how you can create value from new sources. So it almost seems like we're talking about diversification of energy sources. I don't think you're going to uh, replace coal and oil and gas. Um, it is such a huge part of our economy and our history um, and what we produce. But having other sources and also having uh, value add technologies where we can use those raw materials that we're so endowed with and mm -hmm. create new products. And I know they're doing a lot in SCR and engineering to do that with oil brine and CO2, mm -hmm. um, looking at other products that we can create from coal uh, with carbon fiber technology. Uh, so that represents a diversification as well. Can you talk a little bit about options? Uh, the oil and gas and coal that we have in the ground, uh, in the subsurface under the state, represents uh, an option, a lot of potential future value. Uh, it represents future jobs, uh, future tax revenue, uh, and future prosperity. So there is an option in that. Um, and I think there are things we can do to assure that option maintains its long-term value. What do you think, though, we could do to do that? Uh, well, my area and, and what I think is critical is enhancing and preserving a surface access to minerals so that when prices go up, we make sure that uh, the companies can go in and use the newest technology to extract the maximum amount of the subsurface reserves at the highest value, which will create the most value for the state. Uh, if we're in an environment where we can't produce that, then that value's been lost. 
So when you say we can't produce that, what would, I think of pricing, but maybe you're thinking more regulatory, what would prevent? Right, more regulatory, being able to um, move on to the surface, uh, obtain a, a drilling permit, uh, bring in the crews and equipment that are necessary uh, to actually uh, bring those reserves and that value from the ground to the surface. And, and that's the point at which it creates value for the state. What do you think about the current regulatory environment? Is it conducive? Well, I think right now we've, we are in a great position where um, companies and uh, surface owners and regular, regulators have established um, a system of social norms which for the most part are effective. That doesn't mean that there aren't conflicts. Um, and the setback conversations that we're having are, are very on point to what that will look like in the future. And we're talking about setbacks from um, develop, some from housing. Right, from yes. occupied structures. Right, okay. Um, and so we've been talking about you know, what is the optimal distance? And, mm -hmm. and is there an optimal distance and who's in the best position to determine that? Is it uh, the companies with the owners and occupants of those structures? Mm -hmm. Uh, or is it the Oil and Gas uh, Conservation Commission? Or is there a happy medium somewhere, right. hopefully? Hopefully. Yes. And I think that rules that um, provide guidance but allow uh, companies and individuals who are operating in that regulated environment to uh, reach their own negotiated solutions uh, is probably where that happy medium is. But we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, well, Tara, thank you for taking this time with us. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.